welcome to one object, several stories uh, tonight at the library. Uh, and also, um, firstly, would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land, the uh, Kulin Nation people, the Boi Wurrung and the Bunurong here at the library. And also, it will become clear why, uh, the, uh, the Wadarong of the Barwon River and Geelong area as well. Uh, we are going to examine uh, a treasure, uh, by the, um, which is right up there, um, much larger than it really is, uh, as part of looking at items in the library's collection uh, and in connection with the Victoria and Albert Museum exhibition of design treasures here at the moment. So we're going to have uh, a discussion for about three quarters of an hour and then you'll get a chance to ask questions of our wonderful experts. So I'd just like to uh, introduce the others on the panel. Closest to me, Joe Ritali, who's the Collection Services Manager here at the library with nearly 20 years experience of rummaging about in major collections here and in Queensland. Um, her responsibilities include manuscripts, pictures, Australian history and literature collections here at the library. So, you know, just a few things. Um, Louise Burnett, um, who, like me, has worn her morning jet beautiful earrings. Um, she's a specialist jeweller, gemologist and diamond grader and a collector from the French jewel box shop in the Block Arcade, which many of you will have, I'm sure, paused longingly at the windows of. She's intrigued by the history and provenance of antique jewellery and she's a second generation jewellery sleuth in the Block Arcade. And uh, further on my right, Lizzie Anya Petrivna, the Cultural Collections Curator from the National Trust of Australia. She's a Melbourne-based curator and fashion historian. She's interested in 19th century clothes, natural history and domestic advice manuals, so I think I might want to marry her. <laughs> um, and she's completing a PhD on the workers of Melbourne who made artificial flowers and related objects. And she's curated exhibitions of Yoldi wedding fashion and uh, Miss Fisher's costumes most recently. So I'll just introduce the brooch a little bit before the people who really know what they're talking about get a chance. Um, this is a rather extraordinary object. Um, it is made of the hair of two people woven together and gold. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's morning jewellery, the idea of using hair to memorialise people was not just a Victorian phenomenon after Queen Victoria lost Albert. This was much earlier. It was in the, the 1840s. And, uh, oh, no, that's me pointing with the laser. That's not going to help. So here are our two ladies, Carolyn Newcomb, and that's her on the right. Uh, a very early photo. We're not sure exactly when, but I would think... I've got other experts here, but after 1860s, 1870s... You would have said earlier... Yeah, okay, so that's really early to have a camera in the, in the colony. Um, and that is an artist's impression of <laughs> where they look like, I don't know, they have the plague and bonnets and they're doing it quite hard um, near Geelong. So um, Anne Drysdale and Carolyn Newcomb were fascinating women. They, uh, they met up uh, in Victoria very early um, and there's no doubt that from that moment they were constant companions and uh, shared a bed and, in fact, farmed together for a long time. Um, one of the fellows at the library here has done a marvellous job of looking at Miss, uh, Miss Drysdale's uh, diary and, uh, <laughs> and really translating that, that uh, 19th century uh, writing. And then when Miss Drysdale died... Uh, Miss Newcomb actually finished the diary as well. Um, so we actually have um, proof, in a way, that um, of, of this whole story. And quite amazingly, we have a number of objects in the library that add to the story as well. Um, and we can um, also see that um, they were the clients of an architect together. So up the top on the left, this is a, a, from the architectural plans that the library holds in another collection. This is the ground floor plan of their house. So the bedroom at the front and the parlour. And then at where it says ground plan up on the top left, that was sort of the courtyard where all the drays and, and uh, carriages would have come in. And there's the kitchen and the pantry and the stairs. So the, sort of, the story sort of starts to come together. Um, and, and then that's a beautiful drawing of 
the outside of the house, and the next one is a photo, and you can see how closely, um, it, it, you know, and that, that beautiful blue stone that is, that's part of our history. But So Anne Drysdale was a Scot who came to Australia when she was 47. Uh, she had some money and experience in farming, and a year after arriving, she met uh, Caroline Newcomb, who was 20 years younger. And Caroline had been in Australia for a few years already as a governess in Hobart. And, you know, when Caroline came to Melbourne in, in 1836, she was one of only 35 white women in the whole of Melbourne. Uh, there were 177 people altogether. And quite frankly, Caroline didn't really... She had her pick of the men, and she didn't pick anybody. <laughs> so... Um, she took a job as a governess in Geelong, um, and a year after they met, they decided to move together to this house called Corriul, and they were squatters, so they took, um, and some would say stole, 10,000 acres beside the Barwon River, uh, which means that it was land from the Wadharong people, part of the Kulin Nations. And Anne bought money and property to the relationship and did the books, and Carolyn bought youth and horse riding skills and a huge work capacity and a knowledge of the, the colony already and, and hands-on farming. Um, and there, there is a little bit of, well, not controversy, but I think you could say that there was, there's a disagreement about whether they were lovers or good, staunch Methodist companions. Um, I don't think it's really any of our business what went on in, in the bedroom. Um, possibly a lot of card games, um, <laughs> some <laughs> embroidery. Um, but they, um, Anne died in, in 1853 and left everything to Caroline. And many years later, Caroline married an invalid clergyman, many years younger again. Um, she said that she was doing uh, this for God, although her friends would not approve. And eventually she too was buried at Corriul in, um, in the grave with Anne. Um, and she wrote in the... Uh, and Anne Drysdale, who died earlier, wrote in the diary, Miss Newcomb, who is my partner, I hope for life, is the best and most clever person I have ever met with. Um, and I'll just finish with saying, on the 3rd of March, 1854, which is about a year after Miss Drysdale died, Miss Newcomb was carrying on... Um, the diary, and she wrote, Fine and very hot, I rode Fraser's horse to town, by which she means Geelong. Uh, she did her errands, sold oats, 700 bushels at four and six, took Anne's and my hair to Patterson's to set in a brooch for Mrs. Thompson, and he agreed to change my clock, returned home for tea. So we know that, um, that that's... So that's the diary with that beautiful writing. We have the volumes in the library. And that's how the brooch came to be. So um, all of us here have inspected the brooch. And I'd like to ask, just to kick it off, what was the initial reaction of everybody when they first saw it? Jo? Um, well, I'm a little bit grossed out, perhaps, by the <laughs> fact that it's made out of hair. Although, I mean, you, can, you see a, a large version and we actually will have the the brooch out itself a bit later. Um, it's tiny and looking at it initially, I didn't actually realise it was made out of hair. Um, so at first I just thought, oh wow, it's a very interesting looking item, a very beautiful looking item. But then yeah, when you think about it being people's hair and you know, I see hair on the floor and I just think, ew. <laughs> so that was probably my initial reaction. Okay, so we've got one vote for ew. Louise? <laughs> I was uh, delighted when I saw it. Um, the lightness of it uh, in colour was um, quite unusual and uh, the quality of the work is particularly nice. So for me to see it also in quite good condition, there's a couple of little bits um, as you would expect, but it's in really uh, good condition. So for me it was uh, quite a joy. And Lizzie? Um, I was also struck by how white the hair was and how uniform it looked. Um, I also sort of felt it was quite an exuberant looking thing as well, um, very ornamental. But it was the kind of virtuosity of it that really struck me. And I remember asking a few times if anyone had looked at it under a microscope or done any kind of forensics to sort of see what the sort of strands looked like and um, yeah, to investigate further. And, and that's one of the things that we'll talk to Joe about too, you know, how you find what things really are and what, perhaps where they really came from. But first, Joe, what is a library doing with a brooch? Aren't you supposed to just have books? And how come you've got all the, the other things that um, 
come into the story as well because the library holds the brooch, the plans for the house, the diary and the photographs. That's right. And it's, um, it's actually really interesting because they've all come in separately. So they didn't come as a complete package. That is amazing. And, and, and all as donations? Um, yeah, they've all come in as donations. All of those items have. Um, so th the brooch was actually the first item that, that came into our collection and it was, um, it was donated in 1933. So it's been with us for quite a long time. Um, and really all we know um, about that donation was that it was donated by a Miss C. McLeod. So, um, so I was determined to kind of find out a little bit more about, about how the, the brooch had come to the library or even just who Miss C. McLeod was and what her connection was to the brooch. And we actually know that the brooch um, is associated with Anne Drysdale because there was a tag that came with the brooch that said this is the brooch of Anne Drysdale. So that's, that's kind of how we made that connection because at that stage we didn't have uh, Anne's diaries. In 1933 we didn't have any of the other material. Um, so as, as you know, the, the brooch was made for um, a Mrs Thompson and Mrs Thompson was a really good friend of both Caroline and Anne and, um, and she was going back to England um, just about a year after Anne died. And in those days, going back to England was like a two-year round trip, really. And so um, Caroline had the brooch made for her just before she left as a kind of memento, I guess, of, of, of the, that friendship that they had. But then how did we get the brooch if it had been, you know, belonging to sort of Barbara Thompson and they, she had a, a child, one child, Jane, and Jane married um, and... They had kids, but it was it didn't come from that that family. So, and then did I, you use the genealogy genealogy section of the library to do all that? Um, sort of a one stop shop yeah, here in a way, isn't some it? Some of so that some of that research <coughs> is is done through those resources, but also because um, Jane Thompson, Barbara's daughter, had married quite a well known Melbourne identity, and so oh, you make him sound like a criminal. <laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> a, a substantially respectable identity. And so the, he is listed in the Australian Dictionary of Biography and so there's quite a lot of information about him and the children that they had and so it was reasonably easy to follow that strand. The Miss McLeod was much more difficult because I didn't have a first name but there is a lot of references to a Miss McLeod in Anne's diaries and it seems like she was another great friend of the women and I don't know whether it's the same Miss McLeod because obviously it's, we're talking about 70 years later that the brooch is donated to the library. So it's either, it could be the same woman or it could be a, a, a relative. So we're still not 100% sure. Um, the architectural plans were the next kind of items to come into our collection and they came through, again, a donation. Um, a Reverend uh, Brenton was the donor who owned the plans. Um, so he, he gave them to the library. And then the diaries came in 1971. They were on loan for a long time and then the don donation was finalised in 2010. So, you know, sometimes wow. these things take 40 years <laughs> to <laughs> negotiate and one collection manager passes on the history of the relationship with that person and, um, and obviously we keep a lot of files on, on that as well. But it can take 40 years for something to become part of our collection. And then the photographs are the most recent and um, they came to the library in 1987. Um, they're by a photographer, John T. Collins, who had a very long relationship with the National Trust of Victoria, he used to go out and photograph all of their um, sort of heritage listed houses and so, and often went back several times. So the photographs that we have, we have some from 1970s and then we have some from the 1980s. And is it a National Trust property, Coriol now, or is it privately owned? It's a privately owned property. D don't go and knock on the door. That would but be it, rude. But it's it is it is in the I think it is heritage listed. So um, have to be, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's on the National Trust <laughs> register. So they would go and photograph those houses. Okay, wow. And so that's one of the reasons why I guess cataloguing is really important, so that people can make those connections between objects and things. Um, 
So uh, we'll talk a little bit later about keeping things safe, but Louise, our specialist jeweller, um, are these common? Do you see them a lot coming into your business? Definitely not. Um, they they have been ruined. I think they've, by and large, you can find sometimes frames with the hair missing. I think there's been probably a very big backlash over time against hair jewellery. That and it's out of fashion. Out of fashion and and um, people really don't like it. People like all. you, Joe. People go, well, ew. I imagine that's why it was donated. I can imagine somebody feeling it was important and going, nobody wants it. Yeah, I can understand how if it's not um, your friends or your, you know, it's not someone in your family. Um, I think we were all talking before that there's there's hair and there's hair in a way. There's a, <laughs> there's a good core of gothic folk out there who really love this stuff and do collect it heavily. Um, help us out with the symbols, Louise. So there's a liar in the middle and I quite confidently was telling somebody the other day that it had little briar roses. But... Um, no. <laughs> no. Yes, I did, I did wonder. Okay. The symbolism is um, extremely strong in this piece. Basically, your gold as a starting point. Gold was... Um, because gold can be melted and, and solid in alchemical um, terms, it's, it refers to the transition of the soul. So, there's... Um, a, a strong reason for using gold for this kind of jewel. Um, it also represents eternity and perfection. Um, the lyre in the centre uh, is... It, it's got quite a few different meanings. I found some references... Well, it's Orpheus, um, the golden lyre of Orpheus. And I think Orpheus... Who's was, Orpheus when he's at home? He was the son of Apollo. Mm. And, and, and all of this gets debated because there's more than one version of it being ancient stories. But the, the sun god Apollo and one of the muses, Calliope, who uh, did verses and music. And uh, so, so Orpheus was very famous for... Eurydice, uh, his wife, was killed, suppose, again, variations on the myth, um, bitten on the heel at her wedding by a serpent and died. Just gone to the underworld, he found her body and uh, played his harp. He could make trees and rocks and everything move. His music was so beautiful. So he charmed Hades and Hades took pity and said, you, see, you can have your wife back. He rescued her from the dead. He's Whoa. the only one ever to have done it. What a reception, a wedding reception to remember. Yeah, exactly. Well, they love a bit of drama, don't <laughs> yes. they? Um, but the, the uh, problem with the story is that he got to the surface. So he comes out of the underworld, gets to the surface and looks back at her and the condition was you mustn't look until you... Oh. Yeah, she wasn't up yet. Deal breaker. She goes back to the underworld and he loses his wife. So... Um, There's a lot going on in that brooch then. Well, there absolutely is. Now, there's also a cross... We know that Caroline was extremely religious, so the cross is also um, important. And our flowers, not roses, but forget-me-nots. Uh, forget would they have had little blue, um, little blue jewels in them at any point? Or would they uh, just yes, be they did in Victorian jewellery. A little... <laughs> there's so much of it. Sentimental jewellery and morning jewellery is so so huge that um, there's all sorts of variations. Enamel comes in a bit later. They started to enamel forget-me-nots, but this is definitely the little five-petaled uh, flower. It would have had a, a golden centre. Flower blue, leaves are correct. It's, it's spot on. Um, quite naturalistic, really, if, if you know the flower. Um, and, <laughs> and also um, very very known at the time. There was a book, Sentiment of Flowers, um, from Robert Tyas that was re reprinted over and over and over through the 40s, um, 1840s, that is. So everyone would know everyone, the language of flowers. Everyone knew it. And Forget Me Not was one of the really basic ones. Um, and the quote, uh, there's little verses in that book. And the one that is for Forget Me Not was, it softly tells an absent friend that links of love should never rend. So, yeah. 
Well, we're, we're going to run out of time, so we better move on a little bit. But let's um, th that sort of spirograph pattern of the hair. I know both of you um, <laughs> reminded me of the knitting Nancy. <laughs> so I wondered if perhaps that was what had <laughs> happened with the hair. Um, now, Lizzie, you have done some research into the hair workers, and there were hair workers here in Victoria, I think. Um, and here's a chap who I think is making a merkin, but, <laughs> but it does say in the book that this is from that he, he is making hair jewellery, and behind him, those rather anatomical-looking things are moulds that the, the hair was placed in to be sort of set into, into a shape. Is that right, Lizzie? Yes, uh, so that kind of um, machine that he's using that's almost like um, a, uh, a lace pillow um, is, all, is weighted around the base so that the um, braids can, can happen and it actually then sort of travels down through a little hole in the middle and it would be worked a over um, a form. Uh, so the brooch... The, the, that we're looking at tonight um, would have been woven with a centre of a kind of rod um, to kind of keep its keep its shape. Um, so if so we have a look at some of the other um, the patterns and and um, this here it says Alberts and now in those days an Albert was a watch chain. So these ones here, that sort of braided hair that could be made into a chain. These d don't look up Albert jewellery on the internet <laughs> because it doesn't mean that anymore. It's penis, ho horizontal penis piercing now, which I don't think Miss Drysdale and Miss Newcomb had any knowledge of. Um, so, Lizzie and Louise, these are the other kinds of designs, and it, it looks like it was. Um, very easily recognisable, that, that, that these were sort of patterns that people could perhaps go and order. Well, I managed to find um, some really lovely information from the Police Gazette, um, and of course jewellers are often robbed. Um, so finding a list um, of uh, a jeweller called Gant, um, he was a well-known uh, hair work jeweller in Geelong. He had his premises on Ryrie Street um, and he was entering many, many competitions of, in, you know, of, of industry and um, expositions, of colonial expositions and so on, and winning gold medals for his work. Um, and some of the descriptions just from the um, intercolonial exhibition, for instance, he's making roses and thistles and shamrocks, butterflies, um, he's boomerangs and waddies, um, a snake, all sorts of different um, objects. And um, when he passes his way away, his wife takes over from of the business and has her premises in Russell Street and is also exhibiting. Um, but she's making things like temples and architectural oh, structures. Wow. So these are listed on um, uh, in the Police Gazette as being stolen. Um, and as well as just ornamental brooches, colonial gold work, Alberts, um, yeah, so, so quite a variety. Wow, that's, that's amazing. That, so that's just the side of the brooch to show you how 3D it is. Um, and you will be able to see it afterwards, we're going to have a look at a few things. Um, but that was one of the things that really surprised me about it, because when you see the front of it, 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 it feels flat, like a spirograph. Um, and there's just some more, which, which also shows that the that, that liar symbology was very, very common to be used with, with the hair. Um, that is uh, the back, which I'll just leave up for a moment. Um, so, Lizzie, were the hair workers mostly young girls or were they very experienced um, people? Well, it sounds like quite hard to weave yeah. a temple and I have heard that there was a, a tea set made. Um, I think Louise found it online, out of hair. So I guess it's get back to that kind of virtuosity and being able to take, take a handcraft and actually sort of excel and display your work. So that's where these sort of exhibitions were really great places for women to sort of um, show, show their abilities um, and sort of take some of these, um, these tasks and, and create them into an art form for themselves. Um, I found the, uh, the Gantt um, example really interesting because, you know, um, Henry is exhibiting 
while he's alive, but then his wife takes over and is exhibiting temples and all sorts of things. So I kind of wondered what the story was there and who was actually doing the work and who you could actually attribute the hair work part of the jewellery business to and who actually did the using the, um, you know, I guess you can sort of look at it from the hard materials and the soft materials if you wanted to kind of divide it in that way. Um, the... It is, I guess, with a lot of these sorts of skills which require dexterity, um, small hands um, are, you know, un unnecessary. Um, I mean, if you're braiding strands of hair of, of up to, you know, about six strands and, um, and you're weaving them on that, machine, that sort of device that we saw, um, you know, you'd, you'd have to be quite delicate at your, at your work. And Louise, would it, would that hair, the way that it's been treated there, would it be sprongy to the touch? They wouldn't let us touch the brooch. I did want to give it a poke and see if it sort of, you know, had any give in it. It is very springy. Is it? Um, yeah. If you if you touch it, it will. Yeah. It, it it's kind of how it, it gives. Looks. It does. It's still hair, um, not in a natural sort of fall so yes it does have the springiness I guess it's kind of dead once it comes out of our head anyway but I just wonder I've got a secret theory you see that this is actually a Shetland ponytail and I wonder without actually taking a piece of hair which I don't think Joe would let us no there will be no touching of the hair brooch tonight <laughs> um, how do we know or do we just have to kind of believe that it's human hair does what do you think well, I, I, there was terrible scandal about uh, hair. Um, you can understand that hair weavers might be tempted to replace difficult... They brought, um, imagine, extremely curly hair or... Well, this um, is said to be two people's hair and it does look... <laughs> look at your face. Mm, yeah. Um, <laughs> it does seem very uniform, doesn't it, to be two... I mean, in colour and in consistency, to no. be... Do you, do you want my two cents worth I on do, that? I do, <laughs> do very much so. I think it's one person's hair. Wow. I think there was a locket in the centre, which you can see very clearly here, which is no longer in there. It would be right for the piece, uh, for the era and the style. Uh, and I think there was a glazed part in there, and I suspect that Caroline's much darker hair would have been in that locket space. Because she was younger, and whereas it's gone. Miss Drysdale mm. had probably because had the white hair. Because I did hair. loop it and it is, in my opinion, one person's hair. It's so even. Wow. Okay. Um, and do you think uh, Mr Patterson did it all himself or sent it to London? Or do you think the work was done in Geelong? I think the work was done in Geelong. Was yeah, definitely the gold work. They were certainly uh, good enough. Uh, jewellers to execute a piece like this and I asked my jeweller about it and after he sort of wiped his brow and <laughs> said oh hello oh I haven't done talking about the the cheniers on the back which are the sort of pipey looking pieces what are they called cheniers cheniers yeah he said I oh I haven't had to do anything like that and he looked at it and he said oh two days work and then he went make that four <laughs> right wow so yeah that gives you an idea of of how much work would go into it. And I guess just back to the... Sorry, Kaz, just no. back to that idea of is it is it really their hair, what's going on? Um, I brought along a household manual, of course. I can't leave home without <laughs> bringing one of my manuals out with me. Um, it's a Cassell's household guide and there's um, a section on hair work and um, it begins with sort of saying, oh, you must learn to do this yourself so that you don't find yourself swindled and and, you know, find yourself wearing the hair of a stranger. Um, <laughs> and um, certainly the, um, the instructions provided are very simple. So it's all plaiting and curling, um, adhering hair to gold beater's skin, which was the intestine of a lamb. Doesn't sound very palatable. Um, but really it sort of seemed like the ornate stuff was, was professional um, and uh, some of the more simple displays were, were home, were amateur. I did find an interesting uh, piece of information that was in the middle of the 19th century, 50 tonnes of human hair a year was imported into England for use by the country's jewellers. Do we know where it was from? Uh, Europe, across oh, Europe. Oh, wow, yep. okay. 
Um, so that's, I'll just leave it in the back for a sec. Um, now, we've got all the experts we need here, so I'm wondering if you, if you found something like this in, in a drawer at home, um, how would you clean something? And I'm thinking probably a bit of spray and wipe and steel wool. Um, I love saying things like that to Jo. <laughs> um, so firstly, Louise, what, how would you, would you ever touch it in your profession yeah. as a jeweller? Yeah, absolutely. And so okay, you'd have at it if it's with going, some brass. If it's go, well, well, the first thing with this is uh, the the lightness of it. So it could easily have a, a stained spot or something like that. I would go at it with a cotton bud and some water, uh, very gently, just over over it, and I would do that very slowly over the whole thing. You need it to dry out. You don't want mould. Hair often has mould because it's been immersed at some stage and not dried out properly. Oh, wow. Um, and the gold work, again, probably I would leave it alone. I think oxidised this kind of... Because it's textured on the front, that actually looks really good with a bit of bloom to it anyway. So I would be tempted to leave that alone. It doesn't need to be bright and shiny and new looking. Mm. Um, but certainly the hair, I would recommend very gentle because obviously... But don't. Take no. it to Louise yes. if you find yeah, one. Let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> and Jo, what's the, the philosophy? What's the theory of the library? You know, does everything have to be cleaned up and, and gorgeous or do you never... Because I have seen some broken jewellery in the collection. Um, what's, how do you approach that? I think for the library it's about... Um, well. Do we need, I mean, we, we try to keep things as authentic as they were. Or as they, they arrive or as they were in their heyday? Well, probably as they arrive, really. Um, but we also have to make sure that things are able to be handled and stored and displayed because, you know, it's no point in us keeping everything in a dark vault um, and not being able to kind of make it accessible to people. So a lot of the kind of treatment work that we do is is around making being able to make the material accessible so and not shiny and pretty accessible but just so that it can be used or looked at by people so with something like this object again because we are a library and we we mainly deal with paper so we do have um, conservators who um, work with our collection material and we, we mainly have paper conservators. Um, so we would actually get a specialist textiles conservator and, or an objects conservator to, to do any work on this particular piece of, of jewellery. Um, luckily for us, the, the brooch is actually in really good condition um, and that's because we've, we've, we've made a great effort to store it quite um, carefully in a specially made box so that it doesn't have to be handled a lot. So when you see it tonight, you'll see that it, it, it has its own box and it has a little tray that we can lift out of the box so that we don't actually have to touch the brooch because hair is quite fragile. And I, in fact, I should just, I just want to interrupt just to say yeah. that I have seen um, even little um, Safeway lapel badges from the 1970s treated with exactly the same care and, and having their own box. And there are, there's a conservator here called Carolyn Fraser who makes a beautiful box. Everything fits in perfectly. And the ribbons that you can sort of pull a top layer out of and then underneath there's sort of some more things if, if perhaps it's a donation of several things from one person. And it's, it's part of the, the joy of being able to see that everything is treated with the same respect here, which I think is really interesting. I think, yeah, I mean, one of the things is that, you know, about... I mean, one of the things that Kaz and I were talking about when we were talking about the brooch is about how we value objects or how we value material that comes into our collections. And, of course, you know, monetary value is, is something that does come into play. But for us, it's, there's a lot more involved in how we how we assess material and and so it's historical significance it it could be association so this brooch is really important to us because of its association with Anne and Caroline who were very interesting women in Victoria's history not so much because it's a beautiful object but obviously you know that's important as well but for us it could be quite you know it could be a really 
ugly piece of jewellery and we would still consider it to be really important because of its association with those two women. Um, so there's a whole range of things. So, you know, a badge, a Safeway badge can be just as significant to the library um, because it might have belonged to someone who was really integral to Victoria's history. Um, and so that's why we would, you know, we would put it in its own beautiful box just as we do with this one. And that's, that's what I love about that collection is actually from a, a man who went to Collingwood Tech and he kept his prefix badge and then he went to work for Safeway for 35 years and he kept his, um, the badges that kept commemorated, you know, his 10 years, 15, 20, um, and they were obviously really precious to him and it shows some of, you know, some more of Melbourne's working history that is not, not so pretty. Um, so I just want to show some more things um, just quickly. We'll, we'll whip through. Um, but here's some hair jewellery um, we have in the collection, and Joe would be really familiar with the um, things that belong to Georgiana McRae, who um, lived down on the peninsula and was an artist. And bottom right is a miniature that she painted of her dad, the Duke of Gordon, back in Scotland, who was, look, I, I'm going to say it because I can, he was a mad rooter. And he had three illegitimate children, and that's not in the library catalogue, but it's true. <laughs> and so um, Georgiana was one of them, and she came to um, Victoria, and when he died, she painted that portrait. It's in a, a pendant about that big, and it's actually in the exhibition that I've put together, the little one up on the fifth floor that you can see until November. And on the back side of that portrait is, it's, it's a terrible photo because I took it, but you'll have to take my word for it, that on the left at the bottom is a basket weave pattern of Georgiana's own hair on the back of that pendant as a memorial. And up the top is the legitimate wife of uh, the Duke of Gordon, the Duchess, had bracelets made when he died with jet and real diamonds and the ducal coronet on the top. And that was the top of the bracelet that went there. And then underneath, hidden, was her hair in a basket weave pattern. So they were all at it at the same time, but just in their various ways. And this is another brooch which we'll have a look at afterwards in the foyer. It's in the collection. Um, and I mean, I think partly why hair was so important was that it was a way to connect with people who were gone because they were across the seas and someone had travelled a long, long way away. Um, and it was, it was still quite dangerous to do that. You know, there, was, there were no antibiotics. People would drop off from diphtheria or measles or whatever. So you didn't know whether you were going to see somebody again. So they didn't necessarily have to die for you to make the memorial jewellery. Um, but then, of course, when photos came along, much more popular later in the 1800s, things like lockets and that beautiful idea of being able to close a locket and have two faces together, um, which I think is very nice. Um, and uh, this, I've had a blog as part of my exhibition, which is about what people wear to show where they belong or to say something. And so these earrings that I'm wearing are the ones up on the left and they're made of jet and they're from the late 1800s. And I just thought I'd ask Lizzie and Louise, that was um, such a thing, wasn't it? Jet jewellery. And it, they feel like plastic, they feel really light. Um, and I, when I first saw them, I thought they were, loved them, but, they, but they, I particularly love that they have sort of an industrial, cogish kind of look to them. Steampunk. Uh, st <laughs> steampunk. Um, but what was the deal with Whitby Jet? Was it discovered at the same time that Victoria lost Albert or why was Jet such a thing? Yeah, it was, it was pretty close in time. Um, and Whitby is the area in Yorkshire, it. isn't it, where yep, they dug exactly it out? exactly right. Beautiful little town where um, Dracula landed. Um, <laughs> if you've been there, it's so cute. Um, and they still make Jet jewellery there hugely expensive don't um don't buy it there unless you have to um it's it's fabulous because it takes a very high shine uh, and whitby jet was particularly fine you can get jet from other places but there was a decent amount of it they it attracted then uh, very good carvers and um and they made all sorts of things uh, out of it so the earrings that you've got are interesting for that very geometric shape when I first saw a chain from the same era it's probably 1870 it's probably slightly earlier I got the shock of my life I thought oh this is deco 
Mm. And this is quite a few years ago. And, um, oh, she's really good at it now. <laughs> I'm much better she, now. She's no now. <laughs> but um, no, there were some very industrial looking pieces in Victorian jewellery uh, around the 1870s. Um, and I've also heard that uh, you can tell real jet by licking it that it has a certain... Because I guess there were other kind of natural polymers that were available at the time, like gutta percha and vulcanite and those sorts of things. Which that, are rubber, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, and also had a kind of plasticky sort of jet-like... They feel quite different. Jet feels uh, harder but lighter. Um, those other things have a softer feel to them. They also don't take that real shiny black. They're not quite as... And and she's we've got a lot of fake jet in the Trust's costume collection. Um, and I remember, um, I won't mention who, another curator mentioned that she had heard that you can tell the, um, whether jet was real by licking it. And I just wanted to know whether that it was would be true. quite inert. I mean, it's yeah. fossilised coal. Yeah. yeah. I'll lick mine later and I'll report that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and <laughs> it would be rubbery. I'll see. We're, we're going to be talking till three in the morning. But um, <laughs> down the bottom left is a fabric poppy about 1919 in the collection. Um, and bottom, uh, bottom right is a tiny badge about that big that looks quite modern, looks like it's sort of perhaps the bass player in Elvis Costello's band. Um, but it was an actor called Max Clifton in the early 1900s and, and that badge was passed down through his family as a memorial. Um, and here's, we'll be seeing these afterwards too. I just um, put these in because um, lovely Madeline Say from the picture collection who also looks after objects and Joe said that we could, so that was exciting. Because um, there are things that you'll see tonight that won't be on show possibly for years again because once they come out they have to go back for their own protection. But these were... Um, sort of do-it-yourself lapel badges with the, the colours of the English flag um, on, on the left. Uh, Dardanelles, 1915, and then, of course, Gallipoli, 1915 as well. And this was a badge I found early on doing my project, and it was a badge given to mums who had sons in the war, and you got one star along the bar for every son who died. And there was a very different reaction. Some women wore them proudly and some women threw them in the bin. So I, that, I just thought that was really interesting as another form of memorial. And here in the collection there are lots of um, textiles. And although there isn't a textile conservator, there are a few textiles in the, my exhibition upstairs we, we got a conservator in. Um, and, but there were some things that I couldn't show. And one of them was this because it's in such bad nick. It's a morning cape and a little bit of an outfit, and you can see down the bottom left just a little, again, a very bad photo. I didn't know they were going to be blown up on stage. Um, but you can see the little jet buttons and the lace. And I learned this word, top left, that when the fabric is rent, it's called shattered, which it does look a bit shattered. Um, and Lizzie, you work a lot with, with um, costume and, and textiles. Will this sort of thing just stay in a box forever because it's so very fragile now? Yes, once the um, shattering starts, it's irreversible unless, you know, you've kept something in pristine condition and it's been in perfect, perfect in museum environment and it hasn't started the shattering process. You know, it's really, um, it's irreversible. And it's inherent in the textile. Uh, from the, in the late 19th century, um, of course, Silk has always been sold by weight um, and um, textiles, silk was weighted with m mineral salts that um, in, in, the, in the baths would create tin, a tin compound. Um, so the fibres were all impregnated with these salts and so over it's actually a metallic it fabric, is. even though it's not shiny. Yeah, wow. it ga it gives it a kind of scoop, a sort of frou frou, a weight, um, and so it could be sold, and you know, swindle people because, of course, you're paying more for something that's an inferior quality, um, or you could be buying it for its actual um, feel and the sound, the frou frou sound it might make, and and it's a frou frou sound. Well, you know, when, no, it's, silk, when you rub silk like together, rustling yeah, petticoat. Yeah. rustling sound. Yeah. Um, and, of course, you know, over time, uh, it just 
turns the silk to powder. Um, what is also quite troubling when this sort of occurs, um, and I'd advise wearing a mask, is that you can't always be certain that the right um, mineral salts were used, because a lot of people use lead and it would poison the wearer. And then you've got the added sort of chem chemical soup of the aniline dyes, which was some, sometimes um, fixed with arsenic. So... Right. Um, <laughs> Snuggly. Um, and speaking of aniline dyes, because one of the first ones was mauve, wasn't it, and purple. And Perkins. when I looked at this dress, which is in the collection, and they come down in flat in huge... Uh, boxes that are about that tall and, you know, way long uh, from the storage in Ballarat. It's terribly exciting. And then you take off the lid and they're, you know, this crackling um, tissue paper. And there was this darling lying face down in the box for the last hundred and so years. And I was, I got it out because I knew it was mauve from the catalogue and I thought it must be a, um, a half mourning dress because Victoria... Queen Victoria sort of decreed that it should be black and then grey or mauve, and, but it turns out to be a wedding dress. Um, so it's not always what it seems. You have to know a bit more history. Um, we have to move on so that we've got time for questions. Um, but um, I just wanted to, uh, to ask all of you, um, I know that it was considered that mourning was a fetish after Prince Albert died. Um, do you think all these things that we've been looking at are... Um, are weird, or do you think it's just different in different times that now we have tattoos or we have Facebook pages or, you know, do you, do you feel that this is something that somebody might do now, I guess, Joe? you know? Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's weird. Um, she does, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe the, the, the hair thing seems a bit odd, but I guess it's... Big because, I, I mean, I must admit, when I first saw the, the brooch, I didn't realise that working with hair was, was such an industry at that time and that it was actually quite common to have different pieces of, you know, whether it was the Albert or, or a brooch or, or other or bracelets made out of hair. But I guess, um, you know, things, ha personal objects that have some, you know, real strong connection to an individual is something that you see throughout our collection and they come from all periods of time. So, yeah, I don't see that it as being weird and I think, you know, contemporary society does it as well, whether it's, whether it's something that they wear on their body as in the form of a tattoo or a piercing or... Like armband. Yeah, or or it's you know, or it's you know the the friendship bracelets and things that you know I remember from when I was a teenager and we all you know wore them. So I think I don't think it's weird. And actually, so that we can get the questions in, I'm just going to get a little bit vulgar um, and ask Louise if somebody turned up with this uh, to for you to sell, and you popped it in the window of the French jewel box. What would the tag say? Okay, I, without provenance, because obviously with the provenance it wouldn't end up with me, mm. um, I would be probably putting somewhere around two and a half thousand dollars on it. Okay. And Lizzie, what do you think it might have been worth back in the day to have this made? Mm, I think it might have been between five and ten pounds. Which would be what now, do you Ooh, think? I don't like these questions. I can never. No, quite I know it. Out. It is vulgar. Um, oh, I, I would say that that was. I mean, if you think that um, a working man's weekly wage, in to mid to late, was about a pound or something or other. So, you know, you put that into co into context, and it's an expensive. That's two months' wages. Yeah. 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 And Joe, uh, have you insured it? <laughs> Yes. All <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to tell us how much for? No, I can't tell you how much because we um, we have a basically we have insurance for our entire collection. So I imagine that you just get a form and write everything's priceless on it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. I mean, obviously the brooch is priceless to us, and it's interesting because we we don't actually have an individual valuation for this particular collection item. Okay. Um, it's never been out. Well, as far as I can tell, it's never actually gone out on exhibition externally. It's been on exhibition here in our own building. Well, didn't it go to Ballarat for the Scottish exhibition? Um, I don't. I don't know that it did. Or oh, okay. so. So that would be a point where we would get it 
valued. Yep. Um, I'm guessing you don't just call a taxi and say, no. <laughs> say this to... <laughs> no, no, we have very rigorous processes and yeah. hopefully no one from our conservation department is here and cringing at this point in time, Kaz. <laughs> um, no, they're always cringing <laughs> when I ask them things. But no, it's... Um, so we don't actually have a, a, a value amount for, for that particular item. Um, and it, so I was quite interested to sort of hear what Louise would sell yeah. it for as an unprovenanced item and then what we might then add to that considering that, you know, it's got all that history associated with it. Well, before we all go out and have a look, because I was reminded too of, I think that you, that some people can use the remains of a loved one to be compressed into a diamond. Um, we have set one. Oh, okay. So there you go. Oh, that's got the biggest gasp of the <laughs> night, hasn't it? Well, on that cheery note, um, <laughs> we might go out and have a look at the objects. But um, please do check out the exhibitions both upstairs and downstairs. And before we go, I just want to say thank you so much to the library, to Pete on sound, to Zoe and Harry on door. Uh, thank you to Tara Krishna Pillay for organising the whole shebang and doing some research herself. Our wonderful panel, all of whom have done independent research, well, all their lives, but particularly for this evening. So um, thank you for coming. And if we could thank Joe, Louise, and, uh, and Lizzie as well. Thank you so much.